I've been reminded several times I have 39 minutes. <laughs> One of the things, I'm not a real lengthy speaker normally. I try to move along, cover my topic very quickly as I may possibly do in an adequate way. I feel very honored to be invited to participate in this year's lectureship. I was, appreciate Max, he calling me back, I think, in March of last year, invited me and asked if I'd be interested in coming. Uh, it's been a long time since uh, I uh, graduated here in 76 and have lots of fond memories from being a young student here. It's interesting, I have two of my children with me. My daughter's 19 and my son is 16. And they're just about the same age I was when I went to school here. I was one of the youngest students who graduated from Brown Trail during that time. And uh, I feel privileged to have them with me today also. I think about all the great speakers who have spoken from this lectureship since it began. Uh, I think about uh, the school and the great guys who were the administrators and such, Roy Deaver and Andrew Conley and Mac and Roy Hardiman and, and, and James Wilcutt and all these people that had played an important role in my life as I went to school here. And I have a great debt that I owe to this school for preparing me for the ministry uh, to preach the gospel of Jesus uh, during my lifetime. Again, I feel very honored to be invited to participate. My subject matter this morning is the divided kingdom. I cannot think of a subject that's more timely needed in our brotherhood than this subject of the divided kingdom. If you've known much or if you've been around the brotherhood much, it doesn't take long to begin to realize there is division or even splintering within, the brothers, within our brotherhood. That's a very serious issue. And many of the same problems that dealt with the issue of the splintering of, the, of Israel, the division of Israel, are the very same issues that are evolving the splitting and division within the Lord's church today. So I believe it's a very topical, timely subject. It saddens me beyond words to witness the division of the Lord's kingdom. And I know it must also deeply grieve the Lord to witness the vision today as it did with the vision of the nation of Israel. I believe the story is really the story of the vision of Israel. The vision divided, a divided kingdom is really the story of two kings. Uh, two kings from two different attitudes and two different sides. And I think those attitudes oftentimes are still displayed in the Lord's kingdom today and also cause much of the division that's taking place within the Lord's church. Before we can really understand the story, we must walk back in time before, the, uh, before chapter 12, chapter 11, and go back into the story of the last few days of Solomon. Solomon was a man who was known for his great insight and incredible wisdom. But he was also a man who did not heed his own advice. It's incredible to read the books of Proverbs and read the book of Ecclesiastes and realize that Solomon wrote those wonderful words. And yet he himself discontinued following that advice. Just think, at the age of 73, he became in love with, with foreign wives. He then also became involved in, in idolatry, having basically left the Lord in certain ways and pursued the gods of others. As he forgot God, it appeared that he became also a ruthless and oppressive king. If you go back and you read, you can see the taxes and the, and the wealth and the goals that he accumulated during that time to help support his lavish, and out, his lavish and wild lifestyle. He also pursued false gods according to chapter 11 and verse 4 through verse 7. It's due to his leaving God and because of his immorality, because of his uh, idolatry, that God became angry with it. With, uh, Solomon, and we find it also tells us in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 40, that God tells him that his kingdom will be torn into two parts. Ten tribes will leave and, he will, his, and there will be two left. It's hard to believe, and if we begin to look at Solomon, that, that gives us the background of what's taking place. The story's been told. The division's going to take place. The kingdom's going to be rendered apart. And it's hard to believe that one man's sin, because of Solomon's life, Millions of people were going to suffer because of his choices and his decisions. I believe that we need to really think about things that we do as preachers, as gospel, as elders in the church, being cautious to realize the decisions and the choices that we make will have effect for thousands, or for maybe not for thousands, but for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years. As Solomon made these choices, as he chased after wild women and became involved in idolatry, he probably never fully comprehended, or maybe he did, I don't know. But the bottom line is his reactions and his, his uh, unfaithfulness brought devastation to the kingdom of God. And it's hard to believe that millions had to suffer because of him. Everyone suffers from the consequences of sin. Of course, we know that from the sins of Adam and Eve, as we've all suffered the pain, suffering, and death in our own families. We then walk in and we begin to find, after the death of Solomon, we find it leaves a gigantic hole in the leadership of Israel. 
Jeroboam, or Rehoboam, Solomon's son, was quickly appointed king of Israel. Even though he was the son of the wisest man who had ever lived, he did not inherit his father's wisdom. Remember, Solomon came to the throne at a very young, young age. And Rehoboam came at the age of 41, a time when he should have good reason and ability to think. It also amazes me that Solomon did not prepare Rehoboam to take the throne. It amazes me that Rehoboam was not prepared, but he wasn't. He was not prepared to become the king of Israel. Age may bring knowledge, but it does not always bring wisdom, even though he was 41. Despite all these things, all the bad choices that Rehoboam makes, his reign was doomed by the sins of his father, according to 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 26 through verse 31. It was doomed, and that's sad. That was brought upon him. Around 63 at 933 B.C., Rehoboam became king of Israel, but he liked the political skills to reign wisely. He inherited a kingdom that was already in trouble. As one man once said, he says, The very fact that Rehoboam felt compelled to go to Shechem to speak to the northern tribes is evidence of the deep unrest among the people. As, he, as his reign began, the people of Israel were hopeful the tyranny would end. They were hoping that the world would get better, their lives would get better. Solomon had been, a, had been ruthless on them about taxations and, 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 and burdensome on them. And they were hoping this would come to an end as, as Solomon had died. When Rehoboam arrives in Shechem to speak to the people, Jeroboam is also in the crowd. And Jeroboam is a very interesting person because he's going to become the next king of Israel, of the ten tribes. But it's interesting, if you go back and you know the story, we find that Jeroboam had fled to Egypt because he had received the prophecy that he was going to receive the ten tribes. In return for receiving those ten tribes, Solomon found out about it, and Solomon sought to, to kill him, even though he was one of his favorite assistants. So he sought to kill him, and, and Rehoboam runs off to Egypt. Well, somehow, while he's in Egypt, he gets the word that, that Solomon has died, so he felt comfortable to come back. And he is in that crowd to listen to the words of Rehoboam as he speaks to the crowd. Now, as Rehoboam spoke to the, to the northern tribes, they requested that the king remove the heavy tax burdens placed upon them by his father, King Rehoboam. Rehoboam told the people to come back, and he would give them an answer in three days. Now, it's amazing to me, again, that Rehoboam realized, I mean, surely he realized there was problems at home in the northern kings. I'm surprised he didn't come prepared to deal with the problems he was going to have to face. I imagine he'd heard of the people being upset in the northern provinces or the northern kingdoms about the taxations and the burdens placed upon them, but he comes unprepared. So he tells them to come back in three days. It's during these three days that, that Rehoboam makes the biggest blunder of his entire reign. He really pulls a very foolish stunt. He starts off on the correct foot. He began by correctly, by seeking the counsel of the older men of Israel. Their response was simple. You become their servant today, and they will, ser they will be your servants for a lifetime. Very good advice. Be their servants today, and they will be your servants for a lifetime. These older men had great insight into the conditions of Israel and understood the signs of division in the kingdom. It appeared that Rehoboam rejected the advice of the older men because he did not want to be weak. He did not want to give up what his father had accomplished or accumulated during his lifetime. Instead, he sought the counsel from younger men who shared in his youth and in his inexperience. It's also interesting, as you go back and read this, that Rehoboam had also known these men. These were people that he grew up with. These were his buddies. These were the guys he ran around with. And so he's gone to them instead of going to people who, who had, had, had uh, political skills, who knew how to respond, how to deal with people. He goes to some inexperienced kids for advice, uh, and they give him some terrible advice. The young men in the council did not let up. They just imagined, you can just imagine them saying, look at the lifestyle your father had, the ability to live due to the heavy taxation he placed upon the people. You can have it all, just like your fathers. Besides, you are king. And being king gives you that right and, and such. And Rehoboam's folly is, is the folly of the dictatorial fool who forgets that government's role is to serve its people. And that happens within the church. Sometimes we get up there with an iron fist and preachers preach away and we forget we're to ministering to serve people. Not, not, to, not to dilute the gospel, not to change the truth, uh, but we need to understand that we are to uh, encourage people and encourage people to grow and become stronger and, and, and feed the flock and such. 
And here we see Rehoboam's folly is, the fact is, he feels that the people are there to serve him, to make him happy. The day comes and the people of Israel return to receive the answer they requested, to remove the taxation from them. The young man tells the people he will not remove their burden that was placed on them by his father, but rather he plans to increase their burden and make it worse. Some scholars say that even the, one of the gestures has spoken about that, about his finger, is an obscene gesture that he made to the people. He was very blatantly arrogant towards them. He basically says, if you think my father was tough, you haven't seen anything yet. I'm going to show you what hard really is. And one of the saddest verses in the Bible in the story is found in 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse 15. So the king hearkened not unto the, unto the people because he didn't, did not hearken unto the people. He didn't listen. They made a request. He just blew it off. He didn't take it seriously. He really just did not care. His bottom line about his kingship was, it's all about me. It's all about what I want in life. Rehoboam soon discovered that if you mistreat people, you will not receive their loyalty. Even if you are king, they will not be loyal if you mistreat them. He believed the king had no choice. He believed the people had no choice to obey him because God had made him king. And who was going to contend with God's decision of him being king? Who was going to contend with him and contend with God on that issue? The people knew that the king had no interest in them and their needs of the people and, saw the, and that he saw them only as servants. In return, they rebelled against King Rehoboam. The, 12, the ten tribes revolted against Rehoboam. The king in return becomes very angry because he believes that they have removed themselves from his God-given reign. He believes that they have re as they have rejected him, they've also rejected God himself. So he sends Adamor to go take care of the situation. Now this is a real stupid part on, uh, decision on his part because this man's already hated. And the reason he's hated is because Solomon used him to control the, the work task force, to put the burden upon people. And I think that, that Rehoboam thought, I'll send this man up there, and they're going to respond because they're out of fear. They're fearful of what's going to happen if they don't. And in return, instead of submitting, the ten tribes rebel and then stone him to death. Due to the arrogance and stupidity of Rehoboam, the people revolt, and the nation was split into two kingdoms. Ten of the tribes followed Jeroboam and became known as the, kingdoms of, the kingdom of Israel. God had chosen Rehoboam to be the leader of these ten tribes. But Rehoboam determined to make the ten tribes submit to his rule, even if it meant sending his armies to enforce submission. Rehoboam's army was well trained and suited for the task. The army is summoned, the battle plans are made, and God sent word to Rehoboam through the prophet that they must not go and fight against their relatives. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 24. Rehoboam uses considerable self-restraints and finally listens to good reason and does not go and make war against his own kinfolks. We find that that's pretty much where Rehoboam leaves as we stop and we walk into the next chapter. As we go into chapter 12, verse 20, we find that then Jeroboam comes into the picture. We find it the fulfillment of, of, Jer of uh, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 35 through verse 88, 38, as Jeroboam uh, becomes king of the ten tribes. Now I want you to listen to the promise that God has made to Jeroboam. It's an incredible promise. It's just an incredible, incredible promise. If Jeroboam would just listen to what God had to say and follow through with the promise that God had made with him. Now listen as I read this. This is 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 35 through verse 38. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand. That's Rehoboam. I will give it to thee. That's Rehoboam. Uh, Jeroboam. Even ten tribes... And unto his son I will give one tribe, that David my servants may have a lamp always before me in Jerusalem. The city which I, chose, chosen, which I have chosen me to put my name there. And I will take thee, and thou shalt reign according to all that thou souls desire. And thou shalt be king over Israel, and, I will, and it shall be. If thou wilt hearken unto, unto all that I command thee, and will walk in my ways, and do that which is right in my eyes, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, that I will be with thee, and, I, and will build thee a sure house, as I built for David, and will give Israel unto thee. Now this is an incredible promise that's given to him. Jeroboam, I'm taking you, and I'm going to make you king. If you will follow in my steps, you will follow in my uh, walk in my ways, 
Your kingdom will be sure. It'll be solid. Uh, I'm going to give it to you. It's sort of like a, well, it's an interesting passage of scripture because it talks about how powerful that verse is. Now, Jeroboam could not have had a better promise. All he had to do was to keep the commandments of the Lord and his kingdom would be secure. Unfortunately, Jeroboam did not fully trust the Lord. God's plan was not good enough. He had to come up with his own plans. And due to his lack of faith, in the end, he's going to lose this kingdom which God gave to him. All he had to do was follow God's plan, and his kingdom would have grown, it would have prospered, it would have been a mighty kingdom. But that wasn't good enough. He had to come up with his own plans because God's plan, was not, he was concerned, was not good enough to handle the situation. It did not fit the situation of the day he failed. To build a kingdom, it must always be built upon faith in God and upon his word. And any church or any kingdom that's built must be built upon faith, but it must be built upon the word of God at all times. And using that would build a secure kingdom. A sign of lack of faith is when we have to devise our own plans because we do not trust God nor his promises. No one could have taken the kingdom away from Jeroboam if he would have only walked in God's way. No one could have taken it away from him. God would not have let it happen if Jeroboam would have just followed the Lord. But instead, he just starts to devise his own ways and it brings about the end of his own kingdom. One of the first thing he does is fear born begins to fear, fear the outside forces. He begins to fear that someone's going to come with a military force and take this kingdom away from him. But he forgot God promised him that kingdom. No army was strong enough to take a kingdom away from God that he had given to him. But Jeroboam felt he must build his own places, his own strongholds, his own places to take, provide, protect his people and protect his kingdom. He tries to protect himself from losing his throne. He knows that God gave him the kingdom of Israel, but he is not certain that God would allow him to keep it. He believed that it was ultimately up to him to keep it. And he begins by fortifying two cities, Shechem and Peniel. This would, be, this would keep invaders from attacking his country. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 25, it says, Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and dwelt therein. And he went out from hence and built Penuel. So you see what's happening? God gave him the, and he's looking for his strength is in his own might, in his own ability. His own ability to defend it is where he felt his strength was. And God says, it's not there, it's in me. And that's what he needed to learn. And he did not learn that. It's amazing how quickly Jeroboam forgets or either that or just flatly rejects God's promise. God tells him, I will make you and your king, your children, kings forever. What a promise. I will make you and your children kings forever. And just think, God took this nobody, a nobody, a servant of King Solomon, and made him king. Yet this nobody did not believe that God was going to keep his word. He did not have that much faith or confidence in him. Instead of trusting God, Jeroboam began to rely on his own reasoning to save his kingdom. In 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 26 and verse 27, it said these words, now will the kingdom return to the house of David? If the people go up to offer sacrifice in the house of Jehovah at Jerusalem, then will the heart of this people turn back, turn again unto the Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Now what this verse is saying is this. He says, now the second problem, I've got, I've got, I've got these fortified cities, I've got places where I'm secure, places that are safe. But now the problem is these people are religious. You know, they, they worship Jehovah. To worship God, they're going to have to go to Jerusalem to worship God. If they go to Jerusalem and worship, then what's going to happen is they're going to, be, they're going to go back and, and worship there and stay in Jerusalem or, and uh, fall back and begin to uh, uh, submit unto Rehoboam, and they're going to come back and kill me. So the question is, is how do I stop them from going back to Jerusalem? So he comes with a plan. Jared Boehm enjoys the convenience of being king more than he does serving God. His belief is there's no way anyone is going to take his position away from him. It's not a convenient time for him to trust in God with his situation. Jeroboam is afraid that he will lose the allegiance of the people when they go to Jerusalem in the southern kingdoms to offer sacrifices, which God had required for them to do three times a year. God knew this when he gave it to him. God knew that they were supposed to go back three times a year. Despite the fact that, again, it's a lack of faith and lack of confidence that God was going to do what he said he's going to do. So Jeroboam gets fearful. If they go back, I'm going to lose them. God says, be faithful to me and you'll keep them. Instead, he, it all makes reason to him that they should not go back. 
He forgets that he's not a king because the people elected him. He's king because God made him king. Since Jeroboam would not, did not know what to do, verse 28 tells us that he seeks the advice from others. Now, now when he do, we do not know what to do, it's always a good thing to seek advice. But this man again receives bad advice. So you go back and you look at Rehoboam. What does Rehoboam do? He, takes, he has good advice given to him, but he chooses to take the poor advice, doesn't he? And he loses ten tribes. Now, anybody with much brains can say, no, you know what? Rehoboam tried this. It didn't work. So here it is. Jeroboam goes and he finds him some, some guys to give him some advice. And the advice he's looking for is, how do I keep my kingdom? How do I make my kingdom grow? And folks, this is what concerns me in the brotherhood a whole lot sometimes. This is where we're seeking our advice from. He didn't go looking for God for the advice. He went out and talked to ungodly, unrighteous men to give him advice on how to build his kingdom. And I think too often, too many of us are going too far out looking for people to tell us how to build the church when we need to go back and look at what God says on how to build the kingdom. It's very simple to build the kingdom, folks. And we do just what the Bible tells us to do. You know, one of the, con uh, one of the concerns I have in the brotherhood right now is that we see mega churches happy, and I'm not against big churches, and, and there's many things I'm not... Uh, mega churches, but the problem is that sometimes they're not converting people, they're just swelling. And that's not good. And, and the point I'm trying to make here is we want to grow church, so we got to go back and start preaching the gospel. we got to start knocking on doors, inviting our friends and our neighbors. That's where growth happens. And what's happening here is, is that Re Rehoboam's looking for a way to secure his kingdom, and he's asking for advice on how to have new little fadangle things going on to help him grow it. And the reality is it's going to cost him the kingdom in the end. And so is with the situation here. He's talking about the importance for him to go back and, and how he's going to devise his own plan. Now, folks, this is a very interesting plan that he comes up with to keep his kingdom. Because to me, it's very uh, 21st century type stuff. I want you to look as we walk through this, what he does to keep people from leaving and going back to the true God of Israel. Now, I believe these people would have gone to Jeroboam, the people of the uh, tribe of the kingdom of Israel could have, would have gone back to Jerusalem. They would have worshipped three times a year like they were supposed to. I think they would have come back as long as Jeroboam walked in the ways of the Lord. God told him it was going to be that way, and God doesn't lie, does he? That's one thing God cannot do. He cannot lie. And God says, Jeroboam, you let them do the right thing, you do the right thing, and I'll take care of keeping the people faithful to you. But Jeroboam, that wasn't good enough. He had to come up with his own plan. This isn't going to work. Uh, you know, I, I can see the handwriting on the wall. You can hear him saying it. Uh, and henceforth, he comes up with these plans. But seeking advice is only part of the answer. We must seek the advice from the right source. In seeking advice, we should not always go to someone who's going to tell us what we want to hear, but go to someone who's going to tell us what God has to say about the dilemma. But Jeroboam goes to a group of advisors who believe they know how to help him. They know better, and they know how to get him what he wants. But they're lousy in righteousness and have little or no confidence in God nor in his word. Jeroboam advisors came up with a plan to make serving God more convenient as means of keeping the people loyal. Their motive was to let the people see that serving, God, serving the God you offer is more convenient than serving the God they used to know. We're going to make this convenient. We're going to make this exciting. We're going to make this new. This is going to be, this is going to be more appealing type thing. And I'm not against new, some change. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. But the bottom line is, look at verse 28. It says, Wherefore the king took counsel and made two golden calves, and he said to them, It is, to, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem, Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Another translation says it's too much trouble for you to go to Jerusalem to worship. Jeroboam built these gods at the southern border and at the northern border. So no matter where you were in the country, it was easier and closer and more convenient to go to one of these altars. I want you to also realize something he does. He uses a historical significant thing to, to reinforce this. He tells them, these are the gods that brought you out of Egypt. Remember that? Remember when Aaron made the golden calves? Remember, that's the same thing was said, wasn't it? It wasn't the golden calves, but, it, but, but the people fall for things like that, and they did on this occasion. Also notice that he tried to tie his religious 
religion to the convenience of the historical past. If you recall, when Moses was up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, the people got tired of waiting for Moses to come down. They told Aaron, build us a God. We don't know what has happened to Moses. And Aaron built them a golden calf and said, These are thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 32, verse 4. The ten tribes were not well versed in the scriptures and probably said, Amen, preach on, sounds great. And then Jeroboam, when Jeroboam made this proclamation, they knew something, they knew it said, they knew somewhere it said something about the golden calves that brought them out of Egypt. Sounds a little familiar to them, but they really didn't get it. Again, he twists the scriptures to get what he wants. And the people didn't even seem smart enough, to enough or care enough to know better. They swallowed the hook, line, and sinker. How? Because they didn't know better or they didn't care enough. Jeroboam calls, his, call, calls what he is offering the people a convenience. Many, and many of the people readily accepted. The kingdom of Israel felt it was great. And we don't have to go, they thought it was great. And we don't have to go all the way to Jerusalem to worship anymore. It sure is nice to have a God we can see, they might say. What, Je what Jeroboam offered was a choice. God, what Jeroboam offers is a choice. God calls something entirely different. It's new, it's exciting, they might say. But God says in chapter 12, verse 30 of 1 Kings, And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. No matter what Jeroboam called it, God still called it sin. He might, call it, he might call it convenience, he might call it something exciting, something new, but the bottom line is God still called it sin. Jeroboam even offered the golden calves in the cities that were already considered holy places in the Old Testament. This is only added to the deception of the people. Many people, did, uh, many people see through the sham that Jeroboam is offering, especially the priest. Many of the priests and those who are dedicated to the Lord left the country and went back south to the kingdom of Judah. They would rather endure hardship under Solomon's son than be part of a convenient false religion. And that's what they did. Instead of going back, instead of staying there and participating, they left the northern kingdom and they went home, mostly the priests. In our New Testament, we are told that when it comes to our faith, we should be willing to endure hardship as a soldier of Jesus Christ. When we have the, cho the, the choice of being obedient to God or going along with the crowd, we should always pick going with the obedience to God. There's an old poem that's called The Road Less Travel. The author wrote that when it came to a fork in the road, he chose the path that was least traveled, and, was, and it made all the difference. God is looking for men and women who are willing to take the path that is less traveled. Not always the most convenient, not always the most easiest, but the right and, the right and appropriate path. Jeroboam got in trouble by leading his people astray. He refused to believe God would keep his promise. Once you start on the pathway of sin, there's no stopping until you come to a full awareness of the destruction of your own deceitfulness. And I don't think Jeroboam ever realized that. So we see several things. We find that he has the holy places, the holy city. We find that he's built the calves there. Now he's got a problem. All the priests have left. So where are we going to get priests? you got to have priests to have worship, you know. So then he comes up with his next plan. Since there are no priests left in Israel, Jeroboam has, his subject, has, has to reject another of God's commandments. The law says that only Levi, uh, uh, Levites could be uh, priests. No problem. Satan has an answer for that dilemma. It says in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 31, And he made, ho made houses of high places and made priests from among all the people, not from the tribe of Le uh, Levi uh, Le Levites, but also from all the people, that, they, uh, that, uh, that were not the sons of Levi. The people found it more convenient to accept these false teachers than to stand for God. Maybe it's the fact that they didn't want to be confrontational. Maybe that's it. I don't know. But the bottom line is they swallowed the hook line. They, they accepted that change. They preferred changes that Rehoboam made. After all, isn't everyone entitled to their own religion and their own opinion, rather? In 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 32 through verse 33, it says these words. And Jared, and this is the next thing he does. So now he's got, the, he's got the golden calves. He's got the holy places. Now he's ordained his own priesthood. Now look, we've got a problem. We've got to have special days. Well, we're going to have our own special days. Look at this. This is chapter 12, verse 32 for verse 33. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the 15th day of the month, 
like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he went up to the altar, so did he at Bethel. Sacrifice unto the calves that he, that, that he had made, the place in Bethel, the priest of the high place that he had made. And he went up unto the altar, which he had made in Bethel, on the fifteenth day in the eighth month, even the month that he had devised of his, what? Of his own heart. Man, he's making all the rules. He knows what the Bible says. He knows what God says. He knows what can be. But hey, I'm going to make my own rules. I like this new rule. He ordained a feast for the children of Israel, and he went up unto the altar to burn incense. This festival was one that he built. This festival did nothing for their spiritual life of the people. They were simply going through religious motions. It was not ordained by God. It was a month of Jeroboam's own choosing. Jeroboam had gone from being a priest and from being a king unto being God himself, or he thought. Not only did he destroy his own relationship with God, but he had hundreds of thousands of others marching down the same road of destruction. His original intent was to protect himself. As a result, the people accepted a false religion, but more than that, they accepted a convenient method of worship. Today, together, they completely walked away from the God who had done so much for them and for their forefathers. This man has left the Lord. It's interesting what happens in the end. The very thing he's trying to do is secure his kingdom ends up being his own destruction. The very security that Jeroboam sought was lost because of his refusal to trust in God and trust in God's plan. His epitaph is found in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 33. And after these things, Jeroboam returned not from his evil way, but made, but, but, but made again from among the people the priests of high places. Whosoever would, he consecrated himself, that there might be priests, on, uh, priests of the high place. And this thing became sin unto the house of Jeroboam, even to cut it off and to destroy it off the face of the earth. Now that verse is very powerful, verse 34. Because it says, because he got... Now listen, remember this. God tells Jeroboam, you walk in my ways, you keep my commandments. Man, I'm going to bless you. Your kingdom's going to be great. It's going to grow. It's going to prosper. And what a great promise he had. But here Jeroboam comes along, the calves of golden calves. He's using the high places. He's setting his own days of feast. He's got his own priesthood. And it becomes sin. And it says in that verse that his kingdom would be cut off. Remember that? That's what it says in verse 34. After all that is said and done, Jeroboam's son reigns two years after become, becoming king. Jeroboam's son and his entire family were killed by the man who overthrew them. The very thing he sought to do, the very thing he sought to secure, ended up being his own demise. All because Jeroboam did not trust in the Lord. Beyond doubt... You see two different men who, with two different styles of leadership. We find that Rehoboam is the one who's pounding people. I'm going to make you submit. This is the way it's going to be, whether you like it or not. If you don't like it, you can leave. I'm going to tell you, folks, I've heard preachers, I've heard people say that. That's pitiful. We should sit back and speak the truth in love, season our, our speech with grace. The Bible speaks about a lot of those things, uh, abiding and, and, and uh, trying to show kindness to one another. But sometimes some people are out there doing, just pounding people away, driving people away. Then you get on the other side, you see the other type of rulership. Let's whatever is convenient, whatever they want, let's give it to them. As long as they stay here, just as long as they don't go down the street to some other church, let's give them whatever they want. And that's what Rehoboam did. Or Jeroboam did, rather. I'm sorry. And we see that in our society. And it's hard for us to understand, to, be in, to, do, to, 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 uh, to work with people and help them grow as God would have them to grow. The divided kingdom is a powerful subject. I think and I hope and pray that you'll go back and study more about what took place. There's so much more that could be said. But the reality is, is there's much for us to learn from Jeroboam and from Rehoboam in our leadership styles, and the way we deal with people. We must learn from the past, or we will be doomed to repeat it in the kingdom of God today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for allowing me to participate, and I hope that I've shared something with you of interest today.